exponentially diverse crowd tonight, which is awesome. But before we get started, one thing that binds us all together are the stickies that Lena, Maddie, and Elliot have left around um, where you guys are sitting. So the purpose of these is um, basically you'll notice you have a yellow one and a pink one. Are they pink or orange? I can't really tell from here. A not yellow one. Um, and the general idea is if you're following along and everything is, you know, hunky dory and you're, having, you're learning things, um, <laughs> keep the yellow sticky um, on top of your laptop, like somewhere over here. And that just kind of indicates to me, as well as everyone in the back, that you know you're following along. You don't need help. If you do feel like you you're falling behind or just need a bit of assistance with something, um, just swap out the yellow sticky for the other one that I'm not going to try to guess the color of anymore. And uh, one of Lena, Maddie, or Elliot will walk over and try to help you one on one. Does that sound good? Cool. So let's get our yellow stickies up, and then I can get started. Um, so while you guys are doing that, I'm noticing that most people in the crowd are kind of beginner to intermediate. So with this being the case, I'll also try to explain a bit about like, you know, the R Studio environment and some basic things about R as we go along. But today's focus will ultimately be on using the ggplot package to plot existing data sets as opposed to like manipulating data sets or whatnot, because that would be a bit of a different session. Cool? Cool. All right, so does everybody have ggplot2 and plotly installed? As in, have you run these commands in your RStudio console? If, um, if you haven't, then, so actually, <laughs> quick, a bit of RStudio anatomy. So if you've got RStudio open, which uh, probably should, you probably see something that's a little similar to what I have up here. Um, our studio consists of these four panes, uh, is what they're called. And the pane on the top left is called the source pane. And this is where you can kind of just write whatever you want. Um, mostly scripts, obviously. But um, this is also a place for you to keep notes to yourself, which I would encourage you to do as you go along in this lesson by using this hash symbol. So this is a note to me. You'll notice it's shaded slightly differently. This won't be interpreted by R as code. So this is kind of the place where I'll be doing most of my, where I'll be writing most of my code. Underneath that, you'll notice this, this console over here. And this is where our R commands are actually run. So although we're writing code over here, this is how we actually interact with R directly. So if you'd like, um, you, uh, you can run code from the source panel right in the console panel just by highlighting a bit of code or, or just being, having your cursor on the line and hitting Control Enter, or Command Enter, or Shift Enter. Uh, different OSs have different shortcuts. Try them all. So I'd like for all of us right now to just run these two commands over here, uh, library ggplot2 and library plotly, uh, without quotes around the names. So once you run these, you'll notice some red text shows up in your console. Don't freak out about that. It's just some information about the package. Um, and in doing so, you're effectively loading these packages into your workspace. So now you can kind of access what's in them uh, as you work within RStudio. Um, so the other two panes over here, this is the environment pane. As we create objects, something we're not going to be covering all that much today, um, they'll show up here. But we're not going to be worrying about that too much right now. And then in the bottom, this is a bit of an all-purpose pane. But today, this is where our plots will be rendering. we will notice it has a few tabs. Uh, I've got the plots one highlighted, and once you make plots, you'll find that they start showing up here. Sounds good so far? Awesome. So the you know wonderful interface of RStudio aside, we are here to plot. And R is kind of known for that. R is known to be this kind of um, environment for statistical computing, for data analysis, for data visualization. And to that end, it has like a lot of awesome you know inbuilt functions. Um, so someone mentioned the crowd that they use uh, base plotting functions. And that's another way of basically saying the plotting functions that are already built into R. So we can take a quick look at those, because of course, like they're there for a reason. They are pretty good at what they do. Um, so the plot command in R, or in base R, as, as it's called, is quite literally just plot. This is an example of what we call a function in R, in that we write the function's name, and then any kind of input um, arguments, arguments is the kind of computer science term for that, within the brackets following the name. So R is a built-in data set called cars. It's, and 
since it's already loaded in in every R section, we can just plot it by running this simple command. So let's give this a shot. Let's write plot cars between parentheses and run that. And you'll notice a plot shows up here, right? We're seeing speed on the x-axis, distance on the y, and this is pretty cool. I'm seeing plot. I'm seeing points. I could probably kind of guess at what the trend is here. But um, and sorry. And by the same token, another base plot function is hist, h-i-s-t, and we can use that to plot well histograms of whatever data we might have. So cars, dollar signs, speed. Here, what I'm doing, and don't worry too much about the details of this, it's kind of not really what we're focusing on, but I just want to show the base plotting uh, functionality of R. Here, we'll be plotting just the speed part of the cars data set. So cars, dollar sign, speed, tell us R that we just want to plot that column. If we put that um, as input to hist, we get a histogram. We can see the distribution of those speed values within this data frame. Following along so far? Great, so that's all well and good. But ggplot is kind of this bigger implementation of what's called the grammar of graphics, um, hence gg in the name. And if you ask me what that is, I don't fully know. <laughs> but the sense of it, uh, or I don't really have a formal definition, but the sense that I get is that it's, it's based around this idea of kind of layering um, different elements of a plot on top of each other to create the actual graph we desire. Um, the actual gram of graphics, if you look it up, is like some philosophy from the 90s about plots, but let's not worry about that too much right now. So for today's lesson, we'll be working with um, another built-in data set called diamonds. And before we can get to plotting that, perhaps we can have a look at what it's actually like. So to backtrack a bit, for I guess, for our beginners, um, in R, often what we're doing is working with these objects called data frames. And data frames are basically just table formatted data. So we can have a look at a data frame, um, or sorry, our data frame, diamonds, by using the head function. So head and diamonds in between. Um, and again, diamonds is a built-in data set in R. So we don't have to like run every, anything else before this. We see a bit of this pretty large table show up here. It probably shows up larger on your screen because I've got text enlarged. Um, but you'll notice that we've got a number of columns, caret, cut, color. Um, and each row here is an observation. It's a data point. And this is kind of the general structure of data frames that we want to be working with when we're working in ggplot. What the head function has really done here is just printed out the first few rows of the data frame so we can kind of get a sense of it without printing out the whole thing. Um, another function we could use to get a sense of our data frame is uh, str or structure. I think it stands for structure. And if you run that, it kind of looks kind of horrible on my screen. So I'm gonna move things around. This basically lists the columns one after the other and their contents. So we can see that the caret column um, contains numerical data, um, as does the depth column. The price column contains integers. Again, don't worry too much about the specifics of this, not really what this lesson is about, but this is the data set we'll be working with. We just got a whole bunch of observations about you know, a set of diamonds. <coughs> and I guess one warning, is, is there anyone here who has what they'd consider a slower computer? No, yes, okay. So fair warning, Diamonds is a large data set. It has 53,000 rows. So if you're worried that your computer might be slow at handling this, just run this bit of code that I'm about to type up and it'll create like a shorter, smaller version of the Diamonds data set for you to work with. So we'll call it Diamonds 2. Um, okay. Um, so what's, what kind of error is it raising? Just saying not found the Uh, let me try something. Diamonds. Yeah, so if you go ggplot2 and then two colons and then start typing in diamonds, do you see this kind of show up in the drop down? whoever's having that issue? Yeah, because if, if that's happening, whoops, um, 
You just try running this function again, the library function. Import ggplot2. Anyways, in the meantime, for our So in the meantime, for our people who worry their computers might not be up to snuff, um, just run this command and wherever I type diamonds as input to functions, just replace it with diamonds too. Um, running this command creates like a shorter version of this diamonds data frame for you to work with. Um, all right, sounded good? The, the diamond thing, sorry, work. Okay, I'll just continue on in the meantime. So, all right, enough waiting. Now we can we can get to actually using ggplot and making the plots we all came here for. So ggplot2 centers around one core function, which is ggplot. And where earlier we used just the plot function to, to invoke base r, ggplot is an analogous function, except this time it'll be drawing on the ggplot library to create the plot that we want. So the first argument, the first, I guess, input we give to ggplot is always the data frame we want to plot. So in this case, uh, it'll be diamonds, of course, and diamonds too, again, if you're using the smaller data frame. After we type in diamonds, this, um, there's always a second argument that goes into the ggplot function. And arguments are separated by commas, for those who might not be as familiar. So we would go diamonds, comma, and then feed in our second input argument. Uh, and this argument is basically defines uh, what is called in ggplot terms the aesthetics of the plot. Um, and between you and, me, you and me, all it means is what's on the x-axis and what's on the y. A um, bit more than that, but at its core, that's really all it means. So I'll just type it out first and explain it. Ace, and then you open another pair of brackets or parentheses. We'll be plotting caret versus price on the y. So basically, all this, the way this should read is we're invoking ggplot on diamonds. And by using the ace helper function, we're telling ggplot that we want the caret uh, data in the caret column on the x-axis and data on the price column on the y-axis. And then we're going to run this and see our beautiful first ggplot. So once you run that in your console, again, using command enter or control enter, you see absolutely nothing. Does everyone see absolutely nothing? Cool. That's fine. Don't freak out. What's going on here is remember how I mentioned that, you know, much like uh, ogres and onions, ggplot is all about layers. So it was a terrible joke, but I had to make it. ggplot doesn't know what to do with our data unless we add on a layer defining what we actually want in our plot. So right now, all we've done by creating this function is told ggplot that I want to plot off my da diamond data frame. This is the x and y axis I want. That's it. To, add, to actually plot our points, first we use the plus operator and plus just literally the plus character, is how we add on layers sequentially in ggplot. So if you just tack a plus at the end of this function and then just hit enter for the sake of not writing everything on the same line, then you can add a layer. And the first layer we'll add is called geome underscore point. And geome point is basically, well, let's, let's actually run this and have a look at it. Um, there are empty parentheses at the end that tells R that you know this is still a function at the end of the day. And if we highlight all of this and then run it, it's gonna take a second because again, this is a big data frame. Suddenly we actually see data. Um, uh, and now we have a scatter plot of carrot on the x-axis and price on the y-axis. And we can immediately deduce that diamonds are really expensive. Um, so what went on here? <clears throat> or sorry, what is geom point necessarily? Geom point is just a layer. It's one of many layers that are available within the ggplot function, um, which I'll be showing you guys a summary sheet of later on. We won't be covering them all because there's, there's quite a bit. Um, and by adding it to this, which we can kind of think of as global settings for our plot, we've just told ggplot, take everything I've defined up here and plot it as a scatter plot. And it does exactly that. So another cool thing we can do is if we really like our plot and you know we want to maybe add on other stuff to it, we can save it to an object. So in R, I'll just write this out as a new line. Object assignment is done using this operator. 
it's less than and then dash. So I'll just write out the plot again, copy paste that same code to the right side of it. And what this basically does is it saves everything here to an object I've arbitrarily called G. You can call it my plot, you can call it, I don't know, diamonds are expensive. It's just the only criteria is there's no spaces in between. And in doing so, so I'm gonna run this up here. Now, if I just run the letter G or whatever you've called your plot in my source editor, it renders the plot again. So this is kind of a convenient way to just, especially if you've got like a longer ggplot call, which we'll get into, to just save it to an object and then invoke it just by um, running that object name. Sorry, I'm using a bit of jargon there. Is everyone following so far? Are there any questions? Great. So on top of the plot we've got over here, we can continue to add more layers. So what if we want to fit a line to this data, for instance? We can do that just by using the POX operator again and using another geome, this time called geome smooth. So again, this bit of code here, G plus geome smooth, is just is basically equivalent to me going plus geome smooth up here with the full code. Ah. These two are basically analogous. I've just saved this part of the ggplot function to an object called g. Does that concept make sense? So I quite like this because sometimes what I like to do is let's say I've just got the scatter plot bit, I can save that to an object and then experiment with other layers added on top while still maintaining that same kind of core structure of layers. So we'll get into more geoms uh, over, the, over the course of this lesson, but that's kind of why that's really useful. So if we run geom smooth, my mouse disappeared for a second, ggplot will try to fit a line to our data. And this line by default is nonlinear. I think it defaults to like generalized additive models. I think that's what it is. But I mean, look at that right here. With three lines of code, we've plotted 53,000 data points and we fit a line to it. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, and I would argue that I think it looks a fair bit better than the base plot function, no offense. So, yeah. Now, I, a question that's often brought up when, um, when people talk about GeoSmooth is how do I get a linear fit? So I'm gonna talk about that really quick before moving on. So remember I mentioned that uh, geoms have brackets at the end or parentheses at the end because they're functions? This is because they do take optional arguments. You can feed them input and modify them. And we won't be covering all the different ways that can happen, but I think a really useful one to know is geom smooth method equals LM. And LM is in quotes. And this is, this is our way of telling ggplot that yes, fit a line, but make it a linear model, um, which I find more often than not is what people actually want. So if we run that, It'll take a second to render, and now we've got a linear fit. I don't know what happened up here. That's odd. It's probably trying to show the whole line. Great, following along so far? Any outstanding questions? Remember that if you do, if there is anything kind of confusing you to put up the non-yellow sticky, and one of the helpers will be right over. Great. So, second. Another cool thing about ggplot often, and this is especially useful when we're kind of exploring our data, when we don't have you know, some specific plot in mind and we just kind of want to have a look at what's in our data frame, um, is faceting. So I'm going to write this out first. We'll plot it, and then I'll talk you guys through it. So let's take our ggplot. Again, g represents our global settings and geom point. So g in itself is the scatter plot. On top of that, we can add geom smooth and then facet underscore grid and cut tilde dot. Take a second to write this down. I know this is kind of like weird notation, but then I'll explain it in a second. And once you've done that, let's give ggplot a second to render it again. And now it's split our entire data frame along um, along the cut parameter, which if we, let me run str diamonds again, just to get a sense of my data frame. You'll notice that cut, where'd it go? 
Cut is basically like, it's kind of hard to tell from here actually, my bad. Um, but within the structure of this data frame, every row is, or every observation uh, is classified as having a fair cut, a good cut, a very good cut, and so on. So what we've done here, oops, shrunk my console too much. Ah. What we've done here is basically told ggplot, make that scatter plot fit lines to the data, but also split up the plot according to the cut um, column within our data frame. And the syntax over here, so I don't know the technical term for it, but I like to, th I like to think of it as kind of which orientation I want my faceting. And what I mean by that is that a cut, tilde, and then dot. If we were to reverse that, or sorry, um, if we were to put cut first, it facets horizontally. It, that's mostly how I understand it. And if we're to reverse those, it, reverse those, so if you put dot or period, tilde, cut, it'll do the same thing, but it'll facet vertically instead. If anyone in the room who has like a better idea of this, of the syntax here, wants to chime in, feel free. But this is the understanding that's gotten me so far. So uh, it's gotten me here uh, to this point. So if you want to facet by something, do you want it horizontal? Put it first. If you want it uh, vertical, kind of on the Y, quote unquote, you put it second. Um, and ggplot will interpret that for you. Great, right, cool. So there's lots of different ways to organize facets. There are different facet commands within ggplot. And all those are summarized, again, in this um, kind of ggplot summary sheet that I'll show you guys again near the end. So now that we've got this plot, we notice that it's kind of cramped. There's lots of, actually, let me pull up the standard scatter plot again. So we've got this big bulk of points. They're all like the same thickness. They're all the same size. It's kind of hard to tell where the actual density of points is, right? For all we know, there could be like thousands more points here than here, but they're all just so dense that they're kind of just blending together into this big block. So fortunately for us, ggplot, and actually I'm going to write out the whole thing this time instead of using the shorthand. So ggplot diamonds, again, define carrot on the x and price on the y, geom point. So geom point actually takes a number of arguments of its own that we could use to kind of modify the points that we're seeing in our plot. And this is kind of true of a lot of layers in ggplot. We can, each of them have unique modifiers, so to speak, arguments you can give them to kind of change their appearance. So for instance, something we might want to do that doesn't really help visibility but if your favorite color is blue, which it is mine, you can make the points blue. All right, it seems to be nested in A, E, X, I believe. Nope, color, steel, blue. So that doesn't really help our visibility, but it's a nice shade of blue. Um, kind of gets the point across though. So here we've, Within geom, oh, geom point, we've kind of expanded these parentheses and given it an input argument, and it's modif been modified accordingly. A bit more of a useful one is the alpha parameter, and alpha on a scale of zero to one determines the transparency of your points. Now, this is really useful if you have, you know, a whole crap ton of points in your data frame and kind of want to get a better sense of, you know, what the distribution is like. Um, so an alpha value of 0 0.2, for instance, where zero is almost like completely transparent and one is completely opaque. Now we can see that a little bit better. We can see where there's like more banding of points, where there's a bit of an absence of points. Let me switch this back to black actually, just because steel blue is not really doing this that many favors. Yeah, so how does that look on for size? Now we can kind of better get a sense of where the actual density of points in our scatter plot is just by modifying this alpha parameter. Um, by, by the same token, let's say we just want to shrink the points as well, because these points are rather large. If they're a bit smaller, that might help kind of the visibility situation here as well. So another argument that a geom point takes in is size. So you can split the arguments again with a comma. So alpha equals 0 0.2 comma size equals, and this is kind of on this weird arbitrary scale. Um, so if we start with size four, for instance, I always end up kind of having to <laughs> plug in random numbers and eyeball it, to be honest. Size four is huge. That's not helping our case. Let's shrink it back down to 0 0.5. 
There, that's a bit better. Now we can see almost even more clearly that there's this like huge chunk of banding over here. The points over here are not really that dense and so on. I'm kind of using like layman's terms to describe things here, but I'm not really um, a diamonds guy. Okay, following along so far? Awesome. So this I think is kind of, out of curiosity, no, actually, out of curiosity. I started that sentence wrong, sorry. So we've got a pretty solid serviceable plot going. We started out with 53,000 observations. And by now, I think we've got a, like a much clearer sense of what's going on than we did just by like staring at the structure of the data frame. Um, and something we might wanna do, let's say we've like made this plot now, and this is great, this is totally going in the paper, we gotta clean it up, make it all fancy. Um, because, you know, as nice as this is, it's still not necessarily like, you know, ready for that nature paper you got in the works. Um, so beyond the actual geomes that affect how your data is presented, so the size of your points, uh, for instance, what kind of fit you've got attached, there's also layers you can add on to modify like the X and Y axes, the you could give the plot a title. So perhaps we could do that to make our plot look, you know, a little bit prettier. So we do this again by using the plus operator to continue to add these layers on top. And the layer for changing the X axis name is XLab, short for X label. So again, we open a pair of parentheses because this is a function after all. And then within quotes, we write the actual name, the, um, the actual access title we want to give. So in my case, I'm not very creative, but I do want that C in caret to be capitalized. So I'm just going to type caret with a capital C. And then I think I'm going to do the same thing for the Y axis. So again, plus operator, then Y lab in quotes, price. Run that really quick. Hooray, capital letters. Um, but even beyond just capitalizing um, access labels, because ggplot by default just takes the names of the columns, um, you can, of course, change that to whatever you want. And then there's also a geom called GG title. I don't know why it isn't just title. Um, GG title to give the actual, to give your plot um, an actual title up top. So I guess for us, we can just write carrots versus price. Again, just adding that on with the plus operator. So then we can highlight all of this and then, whoops, run it again. Great, how does that look? Cool. Um, so one last thing before I move on to a few more geomes and then show you guys Plotly and blow your minds because Plotly blows my mind, um, is the fact that ggplot's default theme adds a gray background. And this is something a lot of people are not really into. But it turns out that ggplot actually has a host of different um, themes. And we can access these just by adding them on as another layer. So if you start typing theme, you'll notice that a whole bunch of these pop out in a drop down menu over here. Um, so theme classic, theme dark, theme get, usually they're about what they sound like. I quite like theme underscore BW or black and white. Um, but you know, pick whatever jumps out at you. And then if you run all of this, kind of the look of your plot is modified. So I quite like theme BW because it's simple. It's got that white background, it looks pretty good to go. But there's a few out there that, um, you know, you can try out and maybe find your own favorite. If you're a real keener want to develop your own themes, talk to me after and we can figure out a way to make that happen. All right, awesome, following along so far? Or any, what's up? How can we put the title in the middle? In the middle of this whole function here? In the middle of the Centering it. Oh, centering it, right. Um, so ggtitle takes in another argument called hjust, horizontal justification, I believe. So actually, no, it doesn't go into GG title. Um, so it's it's a bit of a convoluted bit of code. You have to basically like define an alternate version of your theme. Um, I can 
I could show it to you after. I could type it out here, but it might just look convoluted. Okay, um, but basically it's, it boils down to theme and then within these you basically def go like access title um, and you feed it a few helper functions that basically tell ggplot that you want in the middle, but it's totally possible. I can, I can show you afterwards. Is that something most people are interested in? I can just, okay, yeah, no, I get it. It's something I wanted to. Um, so I, I guess this is a teaser of developing your own themes. So making your own themes happens with the theme functions uh, function, as one might expect. And within the theme function, basically what we do is we write what we want to modify. So in this case, the access title, um, plot title, plot title. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, thank you. Drop down menu and Lena. So you go plot title equals, and then element underscore text each just equals 0 0.5. There, it's in the middle now. So once everyone lights this out and I see some heads looking back up, I'll explain what just went on here. So ggplot is actually like a really kind of complex and rich package. And it features a lot of these helper functions that function within uh, other functions as opposed to on their own. So the one we've been using so far, for instance, is AES or aesthetics. It's not really a function that does anything on its own if you're running the console, but like it, it means a lot to ggplot, for instance. So another one of those helper functions is element text over here. And um, what we did here basically is we defined like a custom theme element, and we're basically telling ggplot that for the plot title, make it a text element, which it already is, but its horizontal justification should be 0 0.5, which means put it in the middle. Whereas you can imagine 0 0.7 or so would be somewhere over here. Zero would be like left aligned and so on. So I'm not really sure why this isn't default behavior. I feel like a lot of people do want the plot title in the middle, but you know, now you know. And um, it's, it's actually the same syntax if you want to uh, develop kind of your own theme, your own kind of um, default plot theme. Uh, yeah. You, you said the element of those contacts just make sure that your title is in text format? Um, and not so much that it makes sure, it's, it's honestly kind of weird to think about and also to explain, but it's like, from my understanding of it, plot title is in itself like a text element, right? Whereas something like the points are a geome. So it's like these different like elements, these different layers of ggplot. Um, so this is just kind of specifying that it is a text element, but also this uh, argument h.0.5 doesn't, it only makes sense within the element text helper function, if that makes sense. It's like this function kind of exists to facilitate us modifying it like this. But like it doesn't limit you to uh, being able to only use certain kinds of titles. No, I mean, if you want to put in like equations and yeah. stuff, then that's totally possible. That actually happens within ggtitle. We can talk about that after. Um, and then you can do the same thing for your axis titles, the titles as well. Great, any other? Outstanding questions. So I won. I did want to walk through a few other geomes, um, such as geome bar and geome histogram, which do exactly what you'd expect them to. But we are nearing kind of. We're about ten minutes away from wrapping up, so I'll just show you guys, kind of, this cool thing called the ggplot cheat sheet. So this is a Google search away. Ggplot cheat sheet. Uh, you don't want the Python one. Sorry, Python users. I'm one myself, I promise. But you want the RStudio one. Um, data visualization with ggplot2. That's the one you should be looking for. And this is this two-page PDF featuring literally everything you need to know about ggplot ever. Um, it looks a little overwhelming, I know. But it's more like it's more a reference than anything else. And to this day, I still refer to it. Like I have a few core geomes memorized, but otherwise, I still have this open when I'm plotting. And in the same way that we use geome point, and we added that to like our global ggplot function to plot a scatter plot, we can add something like, and I'll zoom in over here. Um, so there's geome smooth, which we're familiar with. Where's geome bar? <laughs> Somewhere around here. There's a lot of geomes. Um, oh, here they are. Scale, scored Cartesian. Up here, there it is. Right. So what they've basically done here, just so you can read this better, is they've saved their global functions to again like an, a, an object, the same way I did when I saved uh, my global objects, uh, ah, my global ggplot function to an object called G. 
Um, this is the syntax you'd do. So D here um, would be these global settings, and then D plus geom bar would return something that looks like this. Um, so you could take any data set, you could take diamonds, you could take your own data. And of course, I realize that a lot of people are here to learn ggplot for their own research. Um, so if you wanna talk about getting your own data into our studio to plot, um, totally talk to me after and we can make that happen. Um, but yeah, the idea is you take your data frame object and put it into a global ggplot function, add whatever geoms you want, play around with them, explore your data, and make your cool nature paper plot at the end of it. Um, so there's also, a bit about faceting, about coordinate systems. So if you want to like change the actual coordinates of your plot, zero in a certain part of it, add labels, add text, it's all here. Um, so this is kind of what I've kept alluding to when I said that there's a lot to ggplot we can't really cover in an hour. Um, yeah, so definitely get this bookmark, print it out on a giant poster paper and stick it up in your lab. Something I've been bothering my PI about, but he hasn't budged just yet. Great, did anyone have trouble finding this sheet? No? Awesome. OK, so in our last 10 minutes, we've seen this awesome carrots versus sprites plot. Um, it's, you know, it's great. It tells us a lot of cool stuff about the data. But Plotly is another package. It's kind of an add-on to ggplot2, is one way to put it, that makes your data come to life. That was my best sales pitch impression. So again, library Plotly will import the Plotly functions for use in your RStudio workspace. So if you haven't run that already, I would run that now. Um, so let's run that again for myself. And bam, you've, you're ready to use Plotly. <clears throat> so once you've done this, let me, um, what do I want to do this? See, I don't want to plot 5,000 data points in Plotly just yet. One second. G. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use geom bar all the same, just so I don't kind of make my computer freak out. So I'll plot the cut. Um, so remember when we faceted uh, our diamonds data frame by cut? I'll just make a bar plot for how many data points um, in our data frame correspond to each of the different um, categories in the cut column. So ggplot, again, I'm, use, I'm plotting the diamonds data frame. And my only aesthetic here is cut. So x equals cut. Whoops. Don't know how that happened. x equals cut plus geom underscore bar. And if we actually look at this plot over here, then you know it's a pretty serviceable bar plot. I see we have a lot of ideal diamonds, which is pretty nice. Um, but with plotly, what we can do is <clears throat> kind of create a copy of this um, of this ggplot over here and make it interactive. And to do this, we use the ggplotly function. Um, ggplot, ggplotly. So we'll call this p because I'm very creative with names today. Um, again, we use the assignment operator. p is ggplotly and then g. So notice what I'm doing here. I've created this ggplot function and I'm basically feeding the entire thing as input to ggplotly. Oh no. Okay, if you don't worry about this too much, it shouldn't cause any errors for what we're doing today. You might get like a red warning message uh, in your console. I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. So once you've done this, if you actually run P by itself, or basically like render this plot, you'll notice that nothing happened here. That's fine. But up here, where did it go? Oh no, it's down here now, my bad. Sorry, I'm working off outdated information. See, yeah. So now our plot, if you hover over it, the plot talks back. You stare at the plot and the plot stares back. Suddenly you can hover over things and it tells you stuff. You get the exact values of each of these. You, ha you suddenly have a toolbar up here and you can, you can scale your plot differently. You can zoom in and Hit the pen, um, select the pen uh, ah, tool and pan around your plot. Your plot is alive. <laughs> um, and yeah, basically Plotly is, you can think of it as kind of a wrapper on top of ggplot2. And if you really want to get funky, basically you create your ggplot, you stick it in ggplotly, and then you can just examine it at whatever depth you want. 
it just basically creates this interactive plot within your um, within your RStudio console. Um, so yeah, that's pretty mind blowing, isn't it? <laughs> Better than Blazebot, right? <laughs> it does. It does. I won't. I won't. I won't argue about that. Um, cool. How are we feeling about Plotly? So if you're feeling particularly crazy, which I am for some reason, you can do this with all 53,000 points of your scatter plot, and poor hapless Plotly will try to do something with it. So GG Plotly G. No, not G, actually. I have to get my whole function again. I'm actually, let me do this the cleaner way. Um, old G is my old G, and then old P. Again, you can call these whatever you want. You guys kind of see the workflow here in using Plotly, like creating your GD plot, saving that to an object, and feeding that to GG Plotly. So I'm going to run both of these. And then when I go old P, you're going to get very upset at me. We're getting, we're getting the beach ball. That's how bad it is. But yeah, now we have this interactive scatter plot. If you're one of those people who's lucky enough to have a lab server, this is tons of fun to do if you've got the computing power. Um, and it like, again, a lot of this is really useful for exploratory data analysis, right? Like you can zoom in and see particular parts of your data. And if you really find something you like, then you can kind of cook that up in ggplot, pretty it up using you know access labels and themes. And then finally, and this is the last thing I'm going to talk about, she should have talked about it before Plotly, sorry. Any questions about Plotly before I move on to a few closing things about ggplot? No? Cool. So I talked earlier about how we might have my computer stuck again. Hold G. So I've, I've rendered the old plot again here. One, we'll take a second. OK, so I talked earlier about how you could like really pretty up your plot, but there's no real point to it if it just stays in our studio. Um, of course, you want to export it as some kind of image file, and so you could actually put it into your manuscript or you know send it to your PI or whatever. So for that, ggplot has a super awesome function called ggsave. And what ggsave does is it allows you to save a plot object as, as a file on your computer or on your server if you're working remotely. So ggsave, the first argument it takes is the file name you want. So I can call it you know, um, my plot, and then I'll save this as a PNG file. You can also save it as JP, a JPEG or JPG if you want. Um, PNG usually does it for me. And then the second thing you specify is plot equals, and then whatever the actual plot is. So in my case, it's old G, I guess. Um, and once I run this, it's going to mention that it's saving an image with um, some default uh, dimensions. I'll talk in a second about how to change those. And if you open up Finder, or whatever the equivalent on your computer is, you'll find that it is, what is my, uh, never mind. So if you use the Files tab over here, right next to Plots, you will find it here. What did I just call it? Myplot.png? There it is. That's an easier way to find it than kind of digging for it. Am I clicking on that? Oops, it opened on the wrong screen. Um, you can see that this is now an image file that's been saved to my computer. And now I can do whatever I want with it. So, yeah, question? Uh, well, for me, when I try saving it, it doesn't save the whole thing. It kind of like cut off the top of it. Is it the top like dark? Or is it just blank? Like it just cut it off. Uh, maybe one of the helpers can yeah. walk over and have a look at that. Did anyone else have issues with ggsave? No? OK. Awesome. So how are we feeling about ggplot? Thoroughly so really convinced about how awesome it is? Willing to buy a ggplot sticker? No, not quite yet? That's cool. Um, any final outstanding questions? Could be about anything. Could be about something we didn't cover, but you're interested in doing with ggplot. I still see yellow stickies. Um, cool. Um, 
All right, so it's now the hour. Actually, one last thing I'm gonna mention because it just popped in my head and why not? If, so this is again, another exploratory type thing. If you're like in a real rush and just really quickly want to have a look at your data, you can use the qplot function within ggplot. And qplot is kind of, it's a completely different syntax. So basically you put whatever you want on the x as the first argument, whatever you want on the y as the second argument, and then you define data with data equals to, and then the name of your data frame. So this will create like a super lo-fi plot, which I guess is the default ggplot. And it's really useful if you just want to peek at something without like writing out like a full ggplot call. So qplot is short for quick plot, if you might have guessed that. It's just something useful I thought I'd mention. Okay, did that work out for you, by the way? Uh, she said something about um, if you had a title, yeah. That might help, yeah. Just so it like refreshes the the file in place, I guess. Um, yeah, I guess. Okay, well, give that a shot. Let's see how it goes. All right. Otherwise, that's all I had for you guys today. Thanks for your attention. I hope you got something useful out of it. Uh, if you want, I'll be sticking around. I can answer other questions about how you can better apply this to your work. But uh, otherwise, yeah, thank you.